you know, our goal is to show that these martial artists can have different avenues and do what they love, which is martial arts, and take it in different aspects in life. Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 688. Today, my guest, Coach Justin Ortiz. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show, founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. What does that mean? Maybe you're new. Go to whistlekick.com. You're not going to want to listen through all the things that we do. It's a long list. So go check out whistlekick.com. One of the things you're going to find over there is our store. And I bring that up because we've got bills to pay. Clearly, they're not going into my wardrobe or our backgrounds, but we do try to bring you the best quality show that we can. So if you want to support us, you could pick something up at whistlekick.com. Use the code podcast15. That'll save you 15%. You can also consider supporting us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. We post exclusive content over there, stuff you're not going to find anywhere else, bonus stuff, all kinds of stuff. And we're constantly revamping. How can we bring more value to all of you? You want the whole list, all the things you can do to support us in our mission of connecting, educating, and entertaining traditional martial artists worldwide? Whistlekick.com slash family. Go there. We even post some bonus stuff that you're not going to find elsewhere. And it's free. So check that out. If you want the website for this show, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the place to go for that. We bring you two episodes each and every week. And we think we do a pretty good job. Well, we've been doing it a long time. We're coming up on episode 700 here. A lot of you are still listening. Some of you out there have listened to every single episode, and that blows my mind, and I'm so thankful. If you know Justin Ortiz, you probably know him from his competitive career. There was a period of time where he was just, he seemed untouchable, at least from from my vantage on the outside. But if you know him now, you know that he's doing a ton of stuff. I know what it's like to be a busy person. So when I talk to another busy person about all the things keeping them busy, I really enjoy not just talking about the what, but more so the why. And we got into the why today, and I think it's a great conversation. So stick around, check it out. Justin, welcome to Whistle Cake Martial Arts Radio. How are you? All right. Thank you for having me, man. Yeah. Hey. I'm doing fantastic. Took some time. We had to we had to navigate some busy schedules, but you're here. (laughs) Yeah. You're a busy man. It was crazy. I know. (laughs) felt so bad. I'm like, oh man, I had to reschedule, reschedule. But yeah, I'm glad to be here. Hey, it's all good. Good. What was it? What is it? Good things come to those who wait. We had to wait, and now we expect the absolute best episode we've ever had. No, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> not <laughs> not wow, at all. Wow. Let me clear my throat. Let's. <laughs> yeah. uh, before we started rolling, you said you like being. You like all these things that you're doing. You like being busy. Have you always been like that? Yeah, I've been, I've been always trying to stay busy. Uh, I think I don't, I thrive when it's just like kind of chaotic. I know for some people they're like, I have to be organized. I have to make sure I have this planned and this planned. And, uh, I'm more a go with the flow person. Um, I have been working on my organization (laughs) skills, uh, now that I'm getting super busy, but, uh, uh, but I, I just love that. I just thrive on that. Where am I going? What am I doing? Kind of feel, I don't know why. Uh, but I told myself when I was younger, you know, I, I want to get to the point where I'm like, where am I traveling to this weekend? What's happening mm. this week? Um, and it's happening. So I'm, I'm blessed. I'm happy for that. Did, did that <laughs> desire, that goal come out of competing and traveling around or was it before competition? Uh, it definitely came with competition when i was uh when i was a kid i always wanted to be a world champion and i I wanted to i wanted to hear my name being said out loud and and you know people screaming you know that that feeling and that came true and when that came true i was like you know i I want to not just be the best in the united states but but be the best in the world and and go to these places and, and beat them in their country and mm-hmm. fight them in, in their hometown, you know, and, and I was doing that. When that happened, that's when the seminars started coming. And uh, I just told myself, you know, I want to wake up and, and be like, hey, where am I going this weekend? And so it started with just the seminars, <clears throat> started with just the seminars and just teaching. And um, 
from there, it just grew to, you know, much more things. And, you know, from the seminars, you know, I got to, to do uh, instructor training, business consulting. And then, then I got into the stunt stunts and uh, mm-hmm. acting. And, and then I, that started uh, coming into play with the scheduling and, and being somewhere and doing, uh, doing things and just got even busier. And yeah, that's it. Just, so it just started from when I was a kid and I was like, I want to be world champion to like, I want to be everywhere <laughs> and, uh, you know, and try to do as much things as I can with the martial arts, because, uh, I think the biggest thing for, um, my wife and I, uh, my wife, uh, Juliana Ramos Ortiz, she, uh, she's also a world champion martial artist. Uh, you know, our goal is to show that these martial artists can have different avenues and do what they love, which is martial arts and take it in different aspects in life, whether it's, you know, teaching seminars, uh, doing, uh, in, uh, you know, being an instructor or owning a school or, you know, stunts, acting, uh, professional speaking, you know, and one thing I heard when I was younger is you always got to lead by example. So I, I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to do, I know I have a lot in my plate. I'm trying to do a lot so I can show other, other martial artists that they can do, you know, any of these things as well. You know, if they want to pick one thing and be the best at that, do it. I would guess that the majority of our listeners have competed at least once. Most, most martial artists at some point step into a tournament. And so that to me suggests they're going to understand the commitment to take it as far as you did. It's a lot of work. It's, it's, I mean, I, I, I didn't take my comp, my competitive career nearly as far as you did. And I know how much work I had to put in. Why? We, where did that goal come from? Where did world champion come from? And what made it so important that you were going to put in that kind of time? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I guess it all starts when I was a kid, three years old, uh, for my third birthday, my dad gifted me a white uniform. I said, it's time. <laughs> my dad was my instructor in Shotokan Karate mm-hmm. and he was a fighter as well. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it just, I just saw, you know, his potential and how far he went and how far he could have gone. You know, he, he was, um, you know, at one point he was a national champion, but he didn't go any further than that. And, you know, go, go to any places that I've gone to. And, you know, I wanted to take pretty much the Ortiz name and, and, you know, make it big and, and go out there. And, and one of the biggest, biggest motivation was, is to get out the uh, area I was in. I grew up in Boston, uh, Maverick projects. So I grew up in the, in the hood and, and I wanted to escape that, you know, I wanted, I want, I didn't want that to be my future. Mm-hmm. And so part of that was, was to go see the world. And for me, the only way I was going to see the world was to be a world champion, <laughs> mm-hmm. to, to fight the best and become the best and be invited to these tournaments, you know, across the globe and, and, uh, compete. And that's what ended up happening. So it was, it was a lot of, uh, you know, his external motivations that was happening, uh, that was causing internal drive, you know? Mm. <laughs> so that was, that was the biggest thing for me was one, you know, just want to make the Ortiz name relevant. You know, my father, uh, got me to a certain level, but I was going to get myself to another level and two, um, just to escape that world that I was living in and create this new world that I'm living in now, you know? When, when you talk about your father being a national champion, that there, it, I, I get the sense that there's, there's a little bit more to that story. It was, why didn't he go further? My dad didn't go further because uh, simply we didn't have the money. He didn't have the money. Um, he was very young, had four kids, um, and he was working at a deli, you know, before he had his karate school. Mm -hmm. And, um, and at the time, I mean, just didn't have the opportunity to go out there and and travel to his big events. And the, the time that he did, uh, it's funny when you, when you look at his, uh, trophies and NASCAR 1993, 
in his division, he won uh, pretty much every NASCAR tournament uh, in fighting. And uh, he was a super lightweight fighter, which was you know really cool to see. But 1993 was also the year I was born. <laughs> so he had to take away for like, you know, he had to be away from family. And um, it just, it just, for him, it didn't work out and didn't have the money. He didn't have the opportunity, the resources, uh, didn't have a team, mm. you know, at the time. So, you know, he just, he couldn't, he couldn't go. He couldn't, he mm. couldn't take that far. And uh, that was actually a concern when I was growing up as well. Like, you know, we didn't have the money, we didn't have the funds. And, uh, but I think, uh, you know, I don't want to say my dad didn't have the drive, but I definitely had a different mentality than my father. Uh, um, and mine was, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to create that opportunity. So a lot, a lot of things I, I like preach when I, when I teach fighting or, you know, do speaking is I, I say this, I, I take the opportunity because I make the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I just, you know, one thing that kind of battled my head is how come he didn't, you know, just push for it. But also, you know, he had other things, four kids, very right. young, you know, priorities. Uh, he, he has had a lot of priorities and stuff. Um, and of course, you know, I was lucky enough that, you know, we grew up poor, but, you know, towards like, you know, when I was starting to become a teenager, my mom shifted, um, you know, shifted her life and her career and my dad opened his school and we we're helping a lot there. And, uh, and I was with his hard on hard earned money, you know, being a deli deli manager. Um, and he finally, you know, got to do it. And, um, you know, so I had a little bit during that time when I was, you know, like 14, 15, a little better position in my life that I can pursue it. So I was like, you know, going to take that opportunity. I was like, I'm here now. So, let's uh let's use it use what i what i can have you know what i while i have it so you know that's exactly what happened just you know, i had i had an opportunity when i was 14 to be a part of the usa team for waco and i was like let's do it and i worked my tail off <laughs> you know uh i went around um you know asking for sponsorships you know showing them everything videos of myself and presenting myself in a manner that, you know, you know, got me actually quite a few sponsorships from my local police department, fire department. Uh, you know, um, I used to work for a place called Zoomix, which was actually, uh, in Boston. And it was, uh, we did radio journalism. We did, uh, DJing. We did okay. we learn how to fix audio equipment. It was like an inner city, uh, program, you know, for youth mm -hmm. to, uh, learn pretty much, all it is about, you know, the music industry and, uh, you know, audio and editing and all that. It was just, it was so cool. Um, but they even helped me out, you know, and then I did this, uh, uh, pancakes for Italy. Cause that's, that's where we're going for the USA team, uh, <laughs> pancakes for Italy. And that got a lot of people. I, I just kept inviting people and I was serving them pancakes and my dad was cooking, um, just stuff like that, man. I just, busted my butt so I could get that opportunity to go and we made the money and we went. And from there, that's everything shifted. So mm. I started competing heavily when I was about 14 and actually with, um, there's a really good chance, you know, I grew up competing on the new England circuit. You know, I, I'm sure your dad and I were in the same place at the same time. Um, wouldn't have been in the same division, but, um, that's kind of fun for me to think about, but I, I know that, you know, so there was the commitment that I made, the commitment you made to competition, but also the family commitment. Talking about pancakes, your dad making pancakes, you're serving them up. There must've been conversations about how this impacted the family and the investment that everyone was putting in, you know, what, what was the dynamic of that? Did he did did he want you to go further than he was able to? Was that something that was that you talked about? Yeah. Uh, so th <laughs> there's a lot of weird things that was happening at the time. Well, my parents were divorced, um, mm -hmm. and then I lived with my mom, and my dad was, you know, by himself. And um, so the dynamic of the family was kind of always split, anyways. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it was. Uh, 
uh, it was my brothers and sisters were five, six years older than me. And, uh, you know, they, they didn't really, uh, have their time to do what I did. Um, but they, I, they didn't also have the drive that I did. Uh, so you can see there was like somewhat a little animosity towards that. You know, there was like, mm. you know, well, how come we never did something like that or, or something, you know, along those lines. But, uh, you know, they, they were very supportive of me. Um, they were like, you know, I know we never had the opportunity to do that. You do, uh, you know, don't ruin it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't ruin this chance. Right. So I was like, yeah, you're right. Did you, know, you understand that at 14? Did you I get did. what they were saying? I did actually. Um, but I had a really good, uh, head on my shoulders when I was young, you know, but I mean, still now I'm not saying I don't, uh, but, uh, you know, I always had this voice in my head and, you know, I always think that it was God leading me always into the right direction, you know, and there was a lot of things in my family that happened and, uh, things that, uh, you know, shouldn't have happened. Um, you know, bad things. And, you know, even you know, as far as my dad doing the things he did to our family, you know, that's what, what caused the split. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, or, you know, my brother's kind of leading a wrong path in the streets, mm-hmm. you know, and, um, you know, my sister, she got, she, she got a child at an early age, you know, so there was like a lot of pressure on me since I was a kid. And, um, and I knew that, but there was always this voice in my head that was like, yeah, that, that's something you don't want to do. Stay away from that. Stay away from that. You know, that's actually one of the things that led me to ZoomX, that inner city program, because, um, it was just something different that I saw most kids not doing. And it was like, if the kids are not doing that and they just want to go hang out and do this, um, I'm going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to do opposite of what the kids are doing. Cause I know just, I, I just had a feeling what they were doing was wrong and what I'm going to do is going to be right. Yeah. And so when, you know, when they tell me, don't mess it up, I was like, I understand because I knew where we were, how poor we were, you know, the, the, the times where, you know, we didn't sometimes you know, have food, you know, to eat. So like, I understood, you know, what that meant. And that's why, like, when I went, I, you know, won multiple world championships because I was like, I'm not taking this for granted. I'm going hard. My training, I, I was, I was training like hours each day, blue to the face, throwing up, <laughs> you know, kind of like some blood sport training, you know, my dad's like <laughs> cranking my legs and like, like opened me up into splits. Uh, so it, it, it was, it was insane. Uh, but it was worth it, you know? Uh, but I knew what that, I knew what that meant. And I knew that they had my back. They supported me. You know, I know that, I know that they had that feeling like, I wish I could do what you do, you know, but at no point did they say, you know, why you or, or, um, how, why couldn't it be me? You know, like just kind of like make me feel bad for what I'm doing. Mm. You know, they were always proud of me and they were saying, Hey, listen, we didn't have the opportunity, but you do make us proud. And so, um, you know, I was always thankful for my family for, for being like that, you know, and even my dad, he didn't go as far and he never stopped me. You know, he, he, um, there was times where you can, you can feel that, like that, uh, that push that didn't need to be there. You know, like sometimes you just need a father, not, not a coach. Um, he had a hard time doing that it was just more Mm. more coached than anything but i mean got me to a certain level so (laughs) you can't complain about that it's a common challenge a lot of us have experienced that very 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 hard to to deal with that and i see that with a lot of martial artists when i travel you know you see their kids and you see them playing you know like goofing around and he's like i don't want to push them and you think in your head well like hey listen you know he's a martial arts too you know why don't you push him a little bit more but then you also see the the opposite side where it's like, oh, you meet that that instructor that's like hammering down on the kid. Mm. And it's like, hey man, you gotta back up, man. He just wants a hug from you. He just he just wants you to talk to him. He just wants you to show that you love him and you care for him and, and you support him for whatever he goes through or whatever he's doing. You know, um and I think that that was like the only kind of uh uh problem. Like, or, you know, 
thing that I didn't quite receive at the time. It was more, you know, coach than anything. Um, but you know, I just took that and went with it, but he never, never had that animosity behind it. Like he didn't go that far. So he's not going to take me that far. He wanted me to go as far as it can take me. And, uh, even when I moved to Florida, when I was 18, you know, it wasn't until really I moved that I started getting really good at fighting because I started learning from, you know, sparring with other people and getting mm. to see different types of styles. And I started really developing uh, my fight, my fighting skills. Uh, he got me to a certain level and I just took it further. Yes. Um, but even then, so when I moved, you know, at first he was kind of upset, you know, kind of hurt because we had this thing going at the school and we, you know, we, you know, we had this thing going between him and I, but I just knew that I wasn't going to go past that level. And it's not because he was trying to hold me back is because I know that he only has, he only has that, you know, knowledge or that level, you know, and I had to go, had to get more, but you know, going on, going on further. Uh, he supported me. Uh, well, <laughs> if I'm being honest, I was dating this girl at the time who lived in Florida. All right, uh, say no more. <laughs> that was one of the reasons. That's <laughs> I went to uh, I went to college in uh, Lakeland, Florida Southern College. Uh, I went for uh, mathematics and uh, international business. Okay. Uh, so it was a private college. It was beautiful. It was the number one beautiful campus in the nation. So to go from like Boston, concrete, you know, concrete city, you know, everything, you know pee on the corner of the, you know, <laughs> you know all, all this garbage everywhere to uh, number one beautiful campus in the nation. That was like, that was like, whoa, for me. And I just fell in love with it. And I also went to uh, my first ever tournament that I've won first place at. And this is for any, any, anybody that like mm. is not winning at tournaments or going through it and thinking that they suck or, or you know, that they can't go on. Let me tell you, I sucked as a kid. I didn't win. I started martial arts when I was three. I started competing when I was six years old. I didn't win my first first place till I was fourteen. Wow. Like not even not even a local. And I think you, I, you know the crane circuit, right? Mm-hmm. I think yeah, you, the New England, right? We grew up in that. Uh, not even a local. Just it was it was insane. Um, Hold on one second. Sorry about that. Okay. Someone interrupted. Okay. Um, so yeah, not even a local tournament. Uh, and my first ever traveling tournament was the U.S. Open at Disney. And it was in Florida. Going and big. I was like, yeah, I was like, hey, we're, we're going to this. And again, that's when I really started like training hardcore. And um and I was, I was, I was, I was in the U.S. Open. I'm walking into Coronado Springs Resort, and I'm like, "Please, Lord, if dreams come true, it's got to be here." <laughs> I've been working so hard, been training so hard for this, um, and I won first place in point fighting, continuous, and traditional forms. Um, yeah, and wow. it, yeah, it was just it just blew up, and then so Florida always had this like. Uh, this, this, that was your I, had this, I had this love for it. I'm like, this yeah. is, this is my place. Um, and then, so uh, going to college there and, you know, having that memory there. And, and of course there was a girl there and, <laughs> uh, and it was this change of change of scenery. I was just tired of also looking behind my shoulder, checking my surroundings to make sure, you know, no one was going to hurt me or nothing was going to happen, you know, because in Boston at the time, there was a lot of crime. There was a lot of things going on, you know, this, you know, in an instant, uh, things can happen, especially one, the place I was living in to the place I was going to school in was even worse area of Boston was Roxbury. So yeah. Yeah. (laughs) People from outside new England, specifically people who have not spent much time in Massachusetts don't seem to understand that there is a rough (laughs) element in boston you know people people assume i don't know whether they think because it's cold and snowy you know nobody has the energy to to become a criminal but i mean there's some i've I've seen some stuff (laughs) you know i think that's what it is right the cold everyone's so everyone's so angry (laughs) i'm tired tired of this i gotta hit someone (laughs) 
I wonder if that's true. It could be it. Could be it. I think that's definitely a factor for sure. <laughs> uh, but also <laughs> economic status. It's, it's sure, sure. yeah. People don't realize that you know they see Boston now. Boston's so much has changed. Yeah. You know, like now when when I take people to Boston and I show them around, I'm like, this is. I even say, wow, this is beautiful. <laughs> where, where are we? <laughs> and uh, they're like, oh no, this is. Uh, and I tell them, this is Boston. It's beautiful. It's a great place. It's it's fun to visit. It's not the best to live in because there's you know. And I tell them, you know, there's a lot. There's a lot behind mm-hmm. the scenes that go on. But back then, you know, when I was growing up, it was it was worse. It was it was rough, really rough, and. um yeah, I just, you know, just go from that to like, you know, I can, I can say what's up or nod my head to someone and they, they have the same response, you know, it's like, oh yeah, hey, look, hi, how are you doing? And, and they gave me a high, they gave me a high right back, that positivity. Yeah. I was like, this is the place I want to be. I need to, if I'm going to grow, it's got to be here. Um, I just knew I wasn't going to grow as a person and as a martial artist staying where I was. Sure. There, there's certainly something to be said for for breaking out of where you start. You know, I, I think if you look at most people who have been successful, and this does not this is not to to discredit disparage anyone who's remained where they started. There there are absolutely people who, you know, grow up in a in a single martial arts school and they see success and they achieve their goals. But I think if we were to look at you know and survey people, most people have to break out in some way from where they are, whether that's a new coach or a new school or moving away for college, whatever it is, gives you some, some perspective that you can right. use as you move forward. And you, you mentioned that in moving to Florida, you had access to some other people and it really opened up your fight game. Can you talk a little bit more about that and what that yeah, transition definitely. was like? So uh, going to Florida, um, competing at this event called the Gator Nationals, um, uh, and, uh, there was this, there was a guy that recognized me there. His name was Jeremy Roque. He's from Orlando. And, uh, I was fighting this fighter named Joe Fife, who was a great fighter. And, you know, um, uh, you know, I was kicking him everywhere and, you know, he's, he's an amazing fighter. He's, no, no. At the time he was one of the top lightweights and here I am as a nobody, you know, I'm kicking him all over the place, but it, it, it was, uh, I could tell I was in his hometown. You know, I wasn't getting my points. I wasn't, I was just so, I was hitting him hard, uh, hitting him late sometimes, you know, just trying to get, get the judges to, to get on my side, but it wasn't happening. Uh, and this guy named Jeremy Roque comes up to me. He's like, Hey man, I've never seen someone beat Joe Fife like that. I was like, I didn't beat him. I lost. He goes, no, no, no. You won that fight. <laughs> uh, and I've never seen someone fight like that. Like, uh, you, you have to come to my school, like, and train. Like, we, mm-hmm. I gotta come. You gotta come out. Are you Are you here now? I'm like, yeah. I'm actually in Lakeland, Florida, right now. I'm staying also in Bradenton, uh, Florida, as well. And uh, give him all the spiel. He goes, "Hey, man, that's really uh, Bradenton's kind of far drive. Lakeland's a little closer. But if you ever get a chance, you know, we do sparring on Wednesday nights. And I was like, and sometimes Sundays, you know, we do a big group sparring." He goes in Orlando. We have uh, a really good group, and I was like, "Say less." I'm there. Like I've never had, <laughs> I, I never had a sparring partner. Like growing up, it was just Bob, the bag, <laughs> mm. was my sparring partner. And so to me to get to the level I was, it was still like it was just hitting a bag, you know. So if anyone so, makes so excuses wait a about you, you training, took that as you know, far as you did with, uh. uh an inanimate object and just stepping into competition. That's where your practice was. Yes. That's yes. kind of insane. Uh, <laughs> you know what? I'm going to, so I'm going to actually circle around back to that because there's something that uh, my wife and I are doing right now in business I created. And um, okay. there's a, there's an explanation to that. And sure. that's, that's the reason. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I was just using that as a training partner by the time I was 18, um, you know, I moved to Florida, so I just had that bag, um, and I got to where I was fighting that bag, <laughs> but it was, you know, Jeremy Roque, he's like, Hey, we got, we got sparring going on. I was like, Oh, I'm there for sure. 
I get to spar someone to train. Like that's different. <laughs> like someone's Love actually going to punch a kick at me. Let's go. Um, not my father, you know? <laughs> so I was like, all right, let's go. So I, you know, I went and, um, and I just saw how hard they were fighting. They were fighting really hard, like actually hitting each other, like, really hard i was like oh i love it and uh <laughs> and they're uh great quality fighters they had jeremy roque there a beta ben wally who's a, a school owner for uh, cma in orlando as well uh ramon de la cruz uh, another great fighter from florida just all these great fighters from florida joe fife was there his brother um and they always got together on wednesday nights it was just like the the adults or or the instructors of this area and some some of them came from tampa and drove wow. to there to to spar and i was like wow this is this is a great community like this one owns this school this one owns this school they compete against each other um both like school-wise business-wise and even competition-wise and they get together and spar and i was like wow this is a brotherhood this is a family and I could see that. And, uh, when I got there and I started sparring, I just loved that family. And they became a big part of my growth because I was fighting them and they had, they were different sizes, different looks, different, uh, different type of styles of fighting. And, uh, I was able to pick like, Oh, I like how he does that. I like he does that, or I would do that against him. And, and I really started developing this IQ for fighting. And, uh, and, that's that got me to another level um but you know i love them still to this day we see each other at tournaments and uh you know we uh, just start laughing right away because we tell nothing but jokes to each other but <laughs> uh but the uh, you know I, I actually miss i miss actually being there and you know sparring in orlando because it, it was just uh, it was such a great environment such a, a great family feel but tremendous growth um but in here in Atlanta, we're doing the same thing, getting people from different people, uh, places, schools, getting together, fighting on Wednesdays. And then Sundays, we fight at this guy, Chris Walker School, and we fight there. And, and it's it's awesome to see that brotherhood uh, happening here as well. Is it difficult to pull people in in that way? Because you, you called it as it is. This Orlando group, people competing, not just at competition, but competing for students and that quite often you've used the word animosity a few times that that doesn't always breed a healthy competitive right. culture but it sounds like in orlando you were exposed to a group who recognized you know what we make each other better whether or not they would term it that way that's that's my guess is they recognize on some level oh, we're better absolutely. when we push each other are you finding it easy to convince people this in atlanta or are you having to work at it um there was already like some sparring uh, happening here. Um, okay. Me moving here and then other people coming to work here that were fighters as well, just kind of added to that. So it was, it was easy. It wasn't, it wasn't hard. Um, and uh, I think uh, when you think Atlanta, Atlanta, it's like, you know, you got greater Atlanta. It's just so much yeah. more spread out that, uh, and and saturated that it, it was it was fine um it's it, the competition really you don't get that much competition from each person but uh um maybe there's a couple schools that you know you wish they would kind of you know, just go along but uh and i totally understand like hey listen if you don't feel that way but we don't push you know if, if you want to be a part of it be a part of it if you want to sure. grow grow with us if you don't you want to grow by yourself and grow by yourself we're not saying you can't grow you're not saying you can't get great or get good um you know but uh just that uh atmosphere and environment creates uh a great culture and uh orlando definitely had that they had that for sure uh and they still do and that's why um you know usa sport karate down in florida which mm -hmm. was blitz league but now usa sport karate um they're they keep growing They keep getting a uh, great competition. And, um, and I seen it even like when I was, I ran a school, uh, ran Florida sports martial arts, which is William Canizato school. Mm -hmm. who's the father of Mark Canizato. And, um, you know, I ran, I ran that school and, you know, 
maybe a mile down was Jeremy's school. And, you know, right across the street was uh, a CMA school, uh, you know, that Beta knew where and he had a school that was a few miles this way. And like, and it was funny because we would hear sometimes that, you know, a certain, certain thing happened and another person would go to that school and, and he was like, uh, Hey, they will actually come up to you. Hey, I don't know if you know, but this person's coming to my school. Were they your student? And I'm like, yes. And they're like, what happened? And then mm. we'll tell them, you know, and, but it was, it was this respect. It was this great respect. It was like, you know, Hey, listen, I'm not going to just say yes. Like, tell me what happened with this person and stuff like that. You know, sometimes it's like, Hey, listen, they don't work out here. Maybe they'll work out over there. I'm like, okay, cool. And it's like, you know, we're not going to stop you from getting business get your business, you know? But sometimes we'll be like, Hey, listen, this person's crazy. <laughs> 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 that person you don't want to deal with. I'll tell you what happened. And they'll tell them, Hey, you know, um, just, we heard what happened and it's not, not a good fit for our school either. We're not okay with that. And I was impressed. I was like, wow, that's just an amazing culture that you guys have. And I was just grateful to be a part mm-hmm. of that. And so it um, should be. So it should be, it, it should be. And we know it's not, it's not, that's, it's a hard concept to do with other martial artists and even around the world. I have not seen this like anywhere in the world, but Orlando, you know, and I've seen other people try to do it, but nowhere like Orlando and Tampa and the, you know, Florida has done it. You know, they have a really great culture and respect for each other and everyone kind of knows each other, you know? Um, and Atlanta, I guess that we're starting to grow and get better at that, which is great. It's awesome. Uh, but it's still really hard to see that. And, you know, it has a lot to do with ego as well. You know, some t- uh, martial artists, there's this big ego in, in the martial mm-hmm. arts world. And, and they're like, oh, you know, that person that doesn't fit with our style or do what we do. And, you know, and it's, it's uh, they just got to push that aside and be like, hey, listen, this is for all of us to get better. So if, if you love that culture in Orlando, it must have been something pretty significant that took you out of that oh, to yeah. Atlanta. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, or from Orlando to Atlanta, was that, what What, what was the impetus there? Well, Why? There was more more movement than that. But, uh, oh, okay. Okay. Because <laughs> so, like I, I was in Bradenton and when Bradenton, I was, uh, there was a decline uh, moment in my life. Uh, very hard time where I was working at Walgreens well Cracker Barrel first this heating and air conditioning place and then working at Walgreens bagging up groceries and uh I was like 18 years old and I was on this team called Team Full Circle which I left college because I started traveling a lot more and focusing on martial arts and I was like you know college is not something I want to do I want to focus on this you know and um so I went back to being broke, went back to, you know, like a really rough time in my life. And I was like, this is not, I'm not happy. And I was like, I got to change again. I got to change where I'm at again. And so, uh, you know, made some phone calls. It was an opportunity to be a head instructor in Orlando. And that was for um, Florida sports martial arts, William Canizato. And I was like, I'm there. Um, so in a heartbeat, I actually moved, like grab my stuff again, moved. And, uh, so I ended up in Orlando and I started growing in Orlando. I became, I became a Paul Mitchell team member and, um, and, uh, fighting for them. And, and I, mean, I can't and let started. you gloss over that happening. That's anybody who knows the world of sport, martial arts knows that that's a huge <laughs> deal. You don't get to just drop that one in and move on. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a big deal for me. Um, here I am, like, at a low time in my life, and, uh, you know, Full Circle was great, too. They were a great, great team, um, mm-hmm. one of the best in the world as well. Um, but I was still struggling in my life, and I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And and uh, Paul Mitchell, like, had my name going around, and they kind of recycled that again. And, you know, Chris Rappel was like, hey, you know, our, your name was going around, and, and uh you know, we see that you're on full circle now. Don't know if you have a change of heart. I was like, well, you know, you know, we can still talk about it, mm-hmm. you know, kind of like that. And he was like, don't tell me that. Oh, I'll, we'll go, we'll, we'll be talking right away. I was like, I'm not saying yes or no, but we can still talk about it. And, um, uh, so, and 
they started cycling my name again. And uh, because I was supposed to get picked up when I was a teenager, because my traditional forms was winning as well. Mm. And, you know, people forget that I was doing uh, kickboxing, continuous point fighting and um, uh, traditional forms and winning and all those and all those areas. Mm. And uh, so they were going to get me on the team for my traditional form. So that as well started a junior team for fighting. That never happened. So when I was uh, full circle and I ended up fighting against a Paul Mitchell member, I had this look on my face like, oh, I dare you. Like, you have my spot. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and I would, Who I was it? Go. Do you remember who that was? Yeah, yeah, I do, actually. His name was DeAndre Walker. Okay. Uh, uh, he was actually Coach Damon Gilbert's student. And uh, I hit him with the hardest rich hand I ever hit someone, and <laughs> and I stunned him. And I was like in his face, and I looked at Coach uh, Don Rodriguez, kind of mad, like I can't believe you chose him over over me. And he was like, uh, he had to look like, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> but I just had that. I was like, oh, uh, like like you chose them over me, but that never happened. It's you know just. Time went by and I was ended up in full circle and they thought I lost, you know, interest in Paul Mitchell. And I was like, no, no, there's always been a dream of mine to be on Paul Mitchell. And so, you know, I got the phone call. I was like, hey, this is uh, from Chris Rappel. Like, hey, you know, they're looking at you for being on the team. Uh, the only thing is, since, you know, you're young and you don't have as much experience, because usually when you get on Paul Mitchell, it's, you're the top of the top. You know, I'm, I was just making a name for myself. I wasn't there yet. So this was like an experiment, you know, and, but they, they saw I was making noise and they were like, Hey, listen, you know, we're going to put you on a partial sponsorship. We'll see how that goes. And I was like, Hey, listen, I, I love the offer, but I'm on full circle, fully sponsored team. I, I, I'm not going to give that up for partially sponsored and I'm in college. I have no money. I, I'm, I'm bagging groceries, you know, like <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know if I can do that. He's like, okay, well, let me, let me see what I, what can I, what can I can do? And I'll see if I can call you back right there. When he hanged up, I'm like, I just lost my opportunity to be on Paul Mitchell. What did I do? I'm freaking out. I'm like, damn, I ruined this. <laughs> I suck again. <laughs> uh, so, um, I get a call back later and it was like, Hey, listen, uh, they, they talked and they said they can do that for you but you're fully sponsored but you have to make sure you do your job and i was like say less uh hey i you know i have no problem doing that uh, all my life i was telling myself this is a job and i have to do it now i'm going to train my butt off to, to to accomplish it so this is nothing different he's like okay uh you gotta wait for damon gilbert to give you that official call and uh, before Christmas, I got an official call from Damon Gilbert that was on the team in 2012. And that was a game changer for me. So I moved to Orlando, being a part of Team Paul Mitchell. And um, and just being a head instructor at school on Paul Mitchell now, it you can see the immediate shift in my life. Mm. Like the minute even I got on the team, you know, people like congratulating me. See people like, I can't believe I know a person from Team Paul Mitchell. So even the networking and the and you know how people view you just completely different. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that's 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 a great thing of being a part of Paul Mitchell. It's such a big team and uh, has a legacy behind it, so people know what it takes to be on that team. Um. So yeah, I shifted into Orlando. I was teaching there. I started. Uh, you know, getting better in my life. And I started doing seminars uh, uh, and uh, I fell in love with doing seminars. And my first ever seminar was in Mexico, not even in the States. Okay. How did that happen? Okay. So there's a, story a man. There. Yeah, there is a story. Actually, there's a man named Damien Rodriguez um, who was a teammate on team full circle, you know, before with me. And he was like, Hey, Mr. Mm -hmm. Man, um, I, um, he was running a school and, you know, if anyone knows Damien Rodriguez, uh, he's a Miami fighter. He is an amazing fighter. He's we, one of the, one of the best lightweights in his time, and, but he stopped early cause he started running a school, um, and runs a successful school that's called millennium martial arts. It's great school, great quality, uh, martial artists, you name it. Like, you know, very happy for him that he's he's blown up in that avenue in his life. Um, 
but I always wanted to see him fight more. He was just such a, he was such a great fighter and he still is actually, he could throw down still. Uh, <laughs> and he, he coaches the team millennium now who's, mm. who uh, goes and fights at tournaments. Um, but he, you know, he was like, Hey, listen, I'm doing my school focus on that. I don't have time to go and do the seminar that I usually do in Mexico city for this guy. Um, uh, they said, if I can recommend someone, just wondering if you want to do that. Um, which thankful for him that, that changed, helped change my life because mm. I realized how much I loved doing seminars when I was there. I loved the feeling of it. And it wasn't because I felt famous. It wasn't because I felt like I was the, the big man on the thing. It's just because I felt like I was really going to help, you know, people and to help grow the martial arts and, you know, it, it felt, it felt, uh, accomplished, accomplishing, like I was accomplishing something in my life, you know, it, it, it reminds me of the way you talked about the experience when you moved to Florida, you know, you're providing that same kind of opportunity on a smaller scale, you know, one right. day, two days, whatever for other people, exposing them to other things to help them grow. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and that was my goal. And I, I, felt that happen and i was like uh, i'm gonna start doing some more and so because of that that one in mexico i was like you know i can do this in the states is <laughs> that usually opposite when someone was like you know i do it in the states i can do it worldwide and i did right. it like outside of this country and i was like i can do it in the states and then go to other places with that and it started to happen just a little bit uh but very little and uh but i had a lot going on in my life but still I wasn't good with re uh, relationships with uh, another female, like not mm -hmm. saying I was a bad person, just didn't have healthy relationships. And I was always wondering why. And, and, um, and on top of that, I just felt mentally I wasn't growing and I wasn't going anywhere where I want to be. I know like I became this world champion. I, I did what I wanted to do, gone on the team I wanted to be on. Um, and I was like, but what's next? You know, how, how do I, how do I become like really known all over the world, not just in fighting, but like almost in this way, I was thinking of myself as a martial arts guru, <laughs> you know, how do I, how do I become known as that? Um, so I, I was teaching this kid and, uh, noticed that his, uh, his mother was typing on a computer. Normal, normally when I see someone working on a computer, they must be working from home. Uh, which means they're doing something right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was just in my head. You know, it could be something else. Be like, sure. I just, I just do insurance. They didn't know at the time I'm young and I'm like, listen, that person's working on a computer must be working from home. Got to be doing something right. So I went up to her. I was like, Hey, what is, what is it that you do? She goes, well, I'm a life coach. I'm a life coach and I'm also a professional speaker. And, uh, it's called kick-ass coaching. And she, she was like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I was like, wow, that's really cool. You know, uh, that definitely sounds like something, you know, I can, I want to, I want to know more about, sure. you know? And, uh, she was like, yeah. And then, uh, so days went by and she went up to me and she was like, Hey, here's my card. I see the way you teach. I got to talk to you more. She's like, just let's have a meeting. I was like, okay. You know, I didn't pursue her. She And, um, you know, I always tell the story where, like, you know, I found my life coach. and She would always tell me, well, technically, Justin didn't find me. I found him. Like, I went to him. You know, and, and it's not saying, like, oh, yeah, she went to me. I'm a big deal. No, it's just that uh, she just she saw, she saw something, something in, in you. Me. Right. And and I was, I was so, I'm so grateful that she did, you know, and she um, gave me this opportunity to go meet with her. And I was like, well, for sure, I'm going to meet with you. And uh, when I see this business card, it had uh, said kick-ass coaching and she has uh, boxing gloves with this bra on and like, she, so it looks sexy, but badass. And I was like, that's funny. Um, usually if I see something like that, I'm like, eh, that's kind of throwing me off. But mm. when I saw that, for some reason, I was like, that's badass. I like this. Let me, <laughs> let me, uh, let me definitely see what she's all about. And man. Uh, that that one meeting 
we just kept talking and talking what, and talking. Before and talking. you tell us about the meeting, what were your expectations going into it? Uh, let's see. My expectations. Hold on one second. For some reason, this keeps. Okay, good. All right. Um, my expectations going into this meeting was, uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna see what she does. You know, I'm gonna hear about what she does for her work, and um, I'm just going to learn the steps on. You know what? How can I learn that? And uh, which was very. If anyone knows anything about life coaching, that's not even close. <laughs> not even close. Uh, <laughs> and so I was like, "Yeah, let me just see what she does." No, no, boy, was I surprised! It turned into, you know, story. You know, like tell me your story, and tell me all the stuff that happened in your life, and. And keep talking and talking and talking and talking. And I did. And she kept asking those questions. I kept giving more and more and more. And uh, she's definitely the one that taught me how to be vulnerable and to be an open book. So, you know, we talk about, I know we said earlier, I'm an open book, but it's, I'm really an open book. Yeah, I'm really an open book. Like, I I don't mind being vulnerable. I don't mind showing the sides uh, that I had in my past or the things that were going on with me because, because of her. Um, and she just kept letting me talk and talk and talk. And it was, we led into more sessions and more sessions. And little I know I was be, being life coached and, and I started paying for life coaching. And um, it was the best money I've ever spent. Mm-hmm. It was the greatest investment I've ever made in my life um, because it changed my life. And I remember this one time, she asked me, she goes, what, what is your inner self trying to tell you right now? Like, just, just right now, stop talking, close your eyes. What is your inner self trying to tell you? And I was a person that I always said, I'm never going to change. You know, like, I, I'm, I am who I am because of, because of what I've done and everything like that. I am me, you know, nothing's going to change me, which, you know, people usually say, Oh, you know, like he's never changed. That's so great. Blah, blah, blah. He's always just, or you've changed. That's, oh, that's terrible. No, change is great. Change is the best thing ever for you. you and can't grow I didn't realize changing. that. And I, yeah, you can't grow without being uncomfortable, which means that there's change. And uh, I didn't realize that I was so arrogant and I was like, all right, I'm never going to change. That uh, when she asked that question, I closed my eyes and a voice said, you need to change. And I, I, I opened my eyes and I started tearing up because I've never heard, I've never said that out loud. I never thought about that. It just, the voice in my head said, you needed to change. And I looked at her and said, I need to change. And then that's when she was like, well, now you're ready. And I was like, I, I felt like I was in a Kung Fu movie. I was like, what? I was like, ready for what? What, what are we talking about? What, what just happened? Why am I tearing up? What is this sorcery that you're doing? Uh, <laughs> what is going on? And she uh, just poured a lot into me and um, just gave me a lot of time. And I was being vulnerable a lot, realizing a lot of stuff from my past, like the relationships between my dad and my mom and, and, uh, some uh some mental abuse that was going around some physical abuse that was going around um and even how i view relationships you know that was that was uh that was a big thing for me and uh i just realized i needed to change change my mindset i know i realized also i had a poverty mindset mm-hmm. obviously growing up where i grew up but it didn't help me go any further because i still thought you know i'm this kid from the project where i'm like i can change i can change all that and um i started i started learning more about business and so she started teaching me about business my coaching and i was doing the work and if anyone knows anything about life coaching it's part about doing the work Mm -hmm. and uh it's messy it's uncomfortable and i did it and I still do it to this day. You know, I still do a lot of, uh, you know, growth and reading and, you know, learning and 
because it's important, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and I, I always feel like I can get to that next level. And that's what she taught me. And I'm grateful for that. And so because of that, I learned how to create a business with seminars and private lessons and and get away from just being an instructor. So fast forward, I meet uh, my now wife, Juliana Ramos Ortiz, and she uh, wanted to do karate school thing. She's like, I want to own a karate school. Me, I was like, I want the freedom. I want to do seminars. I want to travel and stuff like that. But um, there How was did you something. Two meet? Me. Say it again. How did you two meet? Uh, we were uh, we were, we met in uh, Minnesota. We were Diamond Nationals. It was a uh, yeah the tournament, and uh, I saw her kicking. And at the time, I was known like I was like oh you know I was, I was like king of the kicks. You know I can I can do all these type of kicks, hit people with all these type of kicks, and uh, and then all of a sudden like I see this 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 girl kicking i'm like whoa wow she's beautiful and <laughs> and also i was like she got a good leg that's awesome and they're like yeah that's the queen of kicks right there and i'm like mm. oh well the queen needs to meet the king right <laughs> i love it i love it <laughs> but uh so we you know we, we kept uh, we kept talking mm-hmm. and uh and one thing led to another we just we just really enjoyed our our uh conversations and and our time being spent together sure. but uh so when she moved from miami she lived in miami i was living in orlando at the time she moved to miami with me to orlando it mm-hmm. was fast we all knew that but i said myself i had my relationships i didn't want actually i didn't want a girl because all my relationships from the past and i learned about what i how i viewed relationships i fixed it but then i said i need to work on myself and the right person will come to me, not me chasing the person. Um, and so I didn't want, I didn't want a girl. And then, uh, when I met her, I was just like, yeah, I'm just going to talk to her. Fine. Whatever. No, of course no. I ended up really enjoying everything about her. And, uh, you know, I had a list of traits that I wanted in a female and she had all those traits and, mm. and she was at the time working on herself, which was like great timing. We didn't, we didn't want a relationship just ended up in one, which was great. Um, so I was like, Hey, you're going to move in. If it doesn't work, we know what it is. We'll go back, you know, cause, uh, I always think that people should, should move in before they get married. Cause like you really know <laughs> if I it's going to work, if you're together in, in a yeah. room, <laughs> like even a little things like doing dishes, right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you pick that one. I wonder if there's a story there. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> so um the uh so we we moved in together and then we start you know sharing our aspirations and goals and she was like, I want to do this school thing. You know, I want to own a school and I was like, I don't I want I want to travel the travel the, the world and do my seminars and keep growing my business. And at the time I was building my professional speaking platform. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's what I want to do, you know. Uh but fast forward, we meet with um I do a seminar for Aaron Hensley, who's with Premier Martial Arts, mm-hmm. and then I meet with Barry Van Over and Miles Miles Baker from uh, Premier Martial Arts, and they're like, "Hey, this is going on." And I saw their transition from uh, licensing to franchising, mm-hmm. and the big things that they were doing, and I was like, "Wow, we have a great opportunity because where we're at in our position, like teaching seminars and stuff, uh, to be a part of this." And then Jill's like, "I really want to do the school thing," so I kind of put my my personal thing on pause and started doing the school thing. Now, not, you know, of course that moved us to Knoxville. We did some training with them that moved us to Franklin, Tennessee. Uh, it's a big and, change from, for, a, for a Boston boy who loved Florida, Tennessee. Yeah. Oh, I love Tennessee. Really? Okay. No, Nashville. Well, not all of Tennessee. Well, let me let me clear that up. Nashville's a whole different animal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Nashville was beautiful, um, and it was so fun. And I still felt like I wasn't in the city, but you can mm-hmm. go into the city. And where I was in Franklin, which was like south of Nashville, it was you know beautiful farm area, and it was very um, very affluent area. So completely different from Boston. So, sure. and I was actually I love Franklin so much. I saw myself living there forever. I was like, this is well, a beautiful place, and. 
if anybody wants to go somewhere, go to Franklin, Tennessee. It's beautiful. Nashville, even more fun. Um, but we even got the cowboy, cowboy hats and boots and everything. We fell in love with the area. Uh, <laughs> started talking with a little country twang, you know. <laughs> so, can, can you mix, can you mix a, uh, like a Boston, like a Southie accent with twang? I'm trying to imagine what that sounds like in my head. I, don't, I, can't, I can't make it work. When you say pocket your car over there, man. <laughs> <laughs> you just did it. Beautiful. I love it. Uh, uh, but uh, it was, um, so we moved to that, to there. We opened a school for Premier Martial Arts there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, got almost close to 50 students before even open, um, which was cool because the opportunity, I was, I learned so much you know, business-wise in the martial arts industry through Premier. Mm -hmm. But, um, but then, you know, uh, we just didn't seem like it was the right fit for us and stuff like that. And I met with, uh, with, uh, Josh Horowitz, who owns a school here in Cumming, Georgia, where it's where we are currently. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was like, Hey, listen, are you married to Premier? You know? And I was like, well, I'm not married to anyone, but you know, I always hear an opportunity. Like, what are what are we talking? And he gave us a, he gave us some really big numbers, you know, uh, six digit numbers that we're wow. talking about. That uh, you know, to um, to come come here and be uh, a consultant, mm-hmm. you know, because at the time, you know, I started, I was, I started to become one of the most sought out instructors in the world for seminars. Mm-hmm. And um, I started learning so much about the business in in Premier. And I think because even though some people say it wasn't a good idea to pause what I was doing, you know, as far as, you know, my professional speaking platform and my business and the seminars and privates, um, you know, and I agree, like I should have never paused that in my life because, you know, that's what I truly wanted to do. But because I went this route, I learned even more. And I grew so much, like, you know, not just the instructor, but like the day to day process of owning a school, growing a school, um, you know, even the the success routines of keeping it clean or keeping it organized, it, you know, those little things, uh, you know, helped me grow so much. And I grew even further than that um, when I learned from Josh Holrich, um, <clears throat> great fighter from Atlanta. Um, uh, he was on Team CJB, which at the time, back then, was, you know, you know sometimes they would beat Paul Mitchell. Like, they were, mm. they were a great, great team. Um, and he's a great fighter, but he's also a smart businessman uh, and just a great person in general. He has a heart of gold. But I uh, learned so much from him. I learned, you know, I learned how to be a better person, mm. you know, with with him. And... uh just really going for the things that make me happy. And, um, and I learned even more about business and I learned, um, and, and I started helping him, uh, duplicate instructors. So I started, I became a uh, chief instructor, started teaching all of his instructors, uh, you know, I was consulting on his business side of things and, and, uh, together we we're just growing his company mm-hmm. and, um, it, it was great. And I, was out of school one day and I said to myself, I'm not happy. And it was funny because like, as I was growing this, which I'm thankful because definitely during COVID time, I would have not been in the position, you know, to do what I do because I was able to still, you know, teach instructors and grow schools during COVID time, you know, Mm -hmm. which, which, which was great. Um, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do seminars and stuff like that. So, you know, everything happens for a reason. God put me in the right place at the right time. Um, but, uh, he, uh, you know, I, I looked at him and I was like, listen, I'm not happy. He goes, is this something I can do or something was something wrong here? What happened? I was like, no, it's, I'm, I'm not meant for this day to day stuff. I know that. And I never wanted to do that. Um, and it was funny because when that happened, when I was when I was growing in in the in the dojo and here we call it the, it's the dojo that's the name of the schools. Um, so I was growing in the dojo, and 
my wife who wanted to do this <laughs> uh, was like, I don't want to do this. I want to do my own thing. I mm-hmm. want to start doing uh, my private lessons, for, uh, building my private clientele for for uh, health and nutrition because she started doing bodybuilding. Um, she was like, uh, I want to, I want to have freedom and I want to, uh, build my personal brand, um, which she's like Insta famous as well. So, so, uh, she's done great doing that, but it, it left me kind of upset cause I was like, that's what I was doing. I, was, I literally was just doing that. And now you want to do that. And now I'm stuck in a school. That's how I felt. And I told, and then I had to rethink that. I was like, whoa, whoa. It has nothing to do with her. You should. I am happy for her to go that route. I mean, she's growing. Uh, but that was on me. I put myself in this position. And um, I, I I don't want to feel stuck. Hmm. I learned what I needed to learn. I've, I've grown. I've, I've grown so much and I'm grateful for it. But I need to go back to what makes me happy. What made me happy was doing my seminars, building my professional speaking, uh, growing, uh, growing in this, in other avenues to show martial artists that they can, that they can also do it. And at the time I started getting into stunts mm. and that's a story on its own, <laughs> <laughs> but what, you know, realizing that if I'm going to do stunts, I need time. I need freedom because I call you say, Hey, I need you for a week over here, blah, blah, blah. Like I just got, I just got called to do a week in a Marvel project. I can't say specifically cool. what for, nice. but it's, I'm so excited for that. Um, nice. Look at it. For, for those of you listening, you you don't see the smile on his face. Like I do. That's <laughs> a, that is a big smile. Yeah. Oh, and nice. I'm so excited for that. It's, it's like, we told ourselves we'll work on a DC project a Marvel project, which I was on Black Adam, you know, not too long ago. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're doing other things as well and different, different shows, TV shows and doing all this stunt work and even some acting, which is cool. Um, nice. but you know, the, the Marvel, the Marvel, I was like, that's super cool. I'm so excited for deal. that. Um, but you know, I need, I need the freedom. I need, I need to be like, yes, I'm, I'm available. I go and I go what I want. And, you know, I want to make sure I am the master of my own schedule. You know, like I, I, you know, if I, if I can't do this, I can do this. I can change this around, flip this over, do this. I wasn't going to do that if I was married to, you know, to a business that is not mine, you know, like a school and stuff like that. Um, even if I owned a school, there is, it requires a lot of attention and people need to realize that they're going to own a school. Just know that requires a lot of your attention, even if you're not in the school, you know? Uh, And I was like, I I don't want to do that. I want to do, I want to build my brand Mm -hmm. and I want to grow on that part, which uh, we're doing currently. So (laughs) there's a pattern that if we, if we go back, you have space, you develop a skill set. That presents an opportunity. You take that opportunity, take that as far as makes sense, reset. Yeah. I think there's been, you've said that that's basically been the story three or four times over the course of your career up until now. And so it sounds like now it's reset, maybe not exclusively, but a great deal into the stunt world. Yeah. Did you ever, like, was that a goal back then? Or is this something that you just kind of said yes to? And you're finding that you love it. Uh, exactly that. Uh, it was not a goal. Um, and the person that like I can credit for this is his name is Christopher Yorka. He was actually the best man of my wedding. He's like a brother to me. Um, and he's out of Miami as well. And he, um, man, he was doing stunts. He's been doing stunts for like 10 years. And, and uh, he was like, hey, I mean, you should do this. Why, why don't you do this with me? Why don't you come? I was like, yeah, sure. Like, that's kind of your thing. I'll let you do that. You know, like, you know, I'm doing my seminars and doing that. Like, I'll let you do your thing. And then um, one day I just went to him to Orlando uh, with his stunt buddies. And we were playing around and doing some like, like fight choreo, fight choreography and playing around with some things. And I like loved it. Like we, mm-hmm. it was, it was so small. It was so insignificant. Uh, you know, like in the, in the stunt world, like it was just like, Oh, we're going to play around and, 
and come up with some concept. It wasn't even for anything, you know, it was just like, Hey, I want a video of this real quick, you know, just having fun in a garage. But it, I, it, it blows me away that that kind of surprised you because when you spoke so passionately, you know, it was almost like there were, there was not quite a chip, a little bit of a defensiveness that, Hey, I also was good at forms. And to me, choreography is the fusion of the com of fighting and forms. Mm -hmm. Two things you did well at and enjoyed. And here it is on a platter where you can make money. Like that, that, that seems like a no brainer to me for you. Right. Um, and it wasn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't know any, again, being from Boston, I don't know anything about that. Sure. And, um, you know, it wasn't, I don't, it was foreign to me. So it was like, I'm, you know, not going to pursue it. And, um, uh, and my, my buddy, Chris was like, no, you'll be really good at it. And I realized when I started playing around with his friends and, uh, you know, doing some, some stuff, my background in martial arts was helping that. And because I had the performance side of things, doing the forms and competing, I realized like this could be something I'd be really good at. But it wasn't just because, hey, it's stunts and acting. You know, it's, it's not like, hey, you know, you did a car flip or something like that, you know, which is part of stunts. But um, it was using what I'm great at, which was the martial arts. Something that I'm passionate about is the martial arts. Using the martial arts to help me in this and uh and i always said like when i started first was building my brand i used my martial arts to become a great seminar instructor i used my martial arts to become a great speaker you know i used my martial arts to become a great competitor you know like my martial arts takes me on those avenues and i realized here's an avenue i didn't i haven't touched and i can definitely do great at but I didn't realize I was going to fall in love like that. Like I didn't realize I was going to have so much fun doing it and I'm having a blast doing it as well. But it was because just like we said, taking that opportunity because you make it I started talking to people and, and started hearing more things. And then I heard Hiro Koda, which if anyone knows Hiro, he is the coordinator. He was the coordinator for uh, stranger things, Ozark, um, I, I mean, numerous things with Stranger Things, Ozark, and um, Cobra Kai. And he's like, and Hirokoro was actually a sport karate competitor and was on Team Metro. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, great, great, great competitor. Um, so I was like, wow, okay. He's he's doing auditions. That's what they said. He was doing auditions. Hirokoro is doing auditions for Cobra Kai and they're looking for karate people. And I was like, say again, say less. <laughs> I'm there. Where, where do I need to go and when? Yes. That's exactly what I said. <laughs> Found out that information. And that's because I, I have no problem asking questions and talking to people and networking. That's, I, I right away. Let's, let's, let's make something happen. So I was like, okay, I'm going. So I went, I did, uh, I performed. I, I, it was like this, like, audition process you know step one was um you had like a minute to show what you got so mm -hmm. i did this extreme form with this blend of this traditional form and no one realized i could trick too you know like they just know me as a fighter but like i can do forms i can trick i could, uh, showed all that and i'm like okay they they said numbers and those numbers had to go away luckily i stayed up i was like sweet i did um how, how many people said, how many uh, people were how many people were in the mix? Oh, uh, hundreds. Hundreds. There was, there, was line, there was lines of people. Wow. Yeah, and um, we were like in groups. And we had like numbers and stuff like that. It was funny. It was kind of like, it was kind of like uh, America's Got Talent or uh, yeah. American Idol, but for like stunts. <laughs> uh, and so second round was show your Rex. And I was like, show the Rex. You know, I didn't hit the, the terminology is throw the ranks. And I saw somebody do it. Boom. And I was like, oh, break falls? Got that. So the cool thing was, again, my martial arts knowledge, I was like, I know how to do break falls, you know. But I could see some of them were doing it in a flashy way. I was like, okay, let me do my break falls in a flashy way. So I did. And uh, they called some numbers. Those numbers had to go. 
I was the one that stayed. Now, the ones that stayed had to go to round three. And round three was you had to do this set of choreo or choreography and have to perform it. So my wife and I, who we both were still up and we made to round three, we're like, okay, we know each other well. Let's let's partner up for this choreo. And we were given this choreo and we did it and killed it. Everyone gave us a round of applause. And oh, it was it was awesome. We like we felt that we did great. Mm. We're like, okay. All right, this is great. Hopefully we get a callback. All we got was like, all right, guys, great job. Um, you'll know if you get a call back, just leave your information here. And I was like, okay. Um, and it was kind of, I was, I was like, I don't know. You know, I showed what I showed. I did great. But leaving my information was the hardest thing for me because it like, seems anticlimactic. Had, huh? It seems anticlimactic. Like was, you put all was. that in and then like, you have to walk out was, not knowing. They're like, oh, you have to leave your headshots and your resume. I'm like, one, I don't have a resume in this. I was like, two, I don't have, I don't even have a headshot. I, I'm like, I didn't know I was supposed to. I just had a picture of me, you know, in my my uh, Paul Mitchell, you know, traditional uniform, black belt. It looked good. It was a great shot. I was like, all right, use that. I put my contact info. That was it. I was like, this is what I can give to you. <laughs> And I was like, and I felt, I was like, I, this feels terrible. That is mm. all I have, but this is what I have. But hopefully what I did was good enough. And um, luckily, having that martial arts background, you know, people are like, hey, did you get called for Cobra Kai first? I did not. I actually got called for Ozark first. Mm. And uh, Hiro Koda, is, he was the coordinator for that as well. So he was like, why don't you come to Ozark? And I was like, oh, what? So my first ever job was a full scale SAG job Ozark. And for anyone and it was like, this is your first job? I'm like, yeah, it's my first job. And they're like, are you crazy? You're just sitting there like it this normally that never happens. And I'm like, oh, okay. You didn't you didn't even <laughs> know, know any better. You didn't you didn't know enough to know how big of a deal it was. Yeah. I was like, oh, I, love I just know this is super cool. I'm like, this is super cool. Like I get to see behind the scenes, the set everything like that, like this, this is dope. I was like, but I didn't know it was like, like you realize like you, I kind of hit the lottery having that mm. as your first job. Totally. Um, but I, you know, of course I'm like, I'm going to show that I, I got this, I can do it. And he's like, okay, man, you're going to be, you're going to be the gunman that goes down the hallway, blah, blah, blah. So here I am, my first uh, stunt job, put a, put a, like a gun in my hand that has the shoots blanks and the explosions going on. And I'm like in the middle of me doing my thing. I'm like, this is so cool. <laughs> I was like, this is awesome. I have to take some shots now and die, but ah, oh, this is cool. You know? <laughs> so I was like, man, it, it, it was insane. But also it's like, Hey, this person had no like, like stunt background, like give this guy a gun. It was kind of like funny to me. But, you know, you know, I've, I've done like training with firearms before. So luckily, again, having sure. that background, I'm like, all right, cool. I can, I can do that. Uh, but, you know, even taking the reactions and reactions and selling it, like if I was acting uh, or performing, just brought me back to, you know, performing for a form, you know, mm -hmm. like, like how I would have to make this person believe it, right? Um, if I was doing my form in competition, I had to make the audience believe that I was, I was hurting or blocking something or hitting something, breaking something or sweeping something up. I was in a fight. You saw it happen. So basically, you know, that moment, that day, I was like, I just did what I normally do on stage when I fight or when I do competitions and forms, you know, just in front of a camera. That's it. Mm -hmm. So because I had this martial arts background, it really helped me to do this. And I just like, this is even cooler now. Like, I'm like, this is awesome. I love it. And um, shortly I got the call again from the coordinator to do Cobra Kai. Oh, that's awesome. And so I did Cobra Kai. And then from there, it just kept going to different TV shows and um, Power Rangers, uh, mm -hmm. Dark Unity's new series, um, which at first uh, when we when contacted about it, it was for stunts, but then, um, uh, it turned it and turned into me being a character and acting, and then my wife was acting as well. So she, uh, you know, um, I can't give much details about it because it hasn't come okay. out yet. But uh, and it also ended up me coordinating the fights with 
my brother, Chris, that I was talked about that helped me teach stunts, you know, mm-hmm. we end up coordinating and choreographing together for this and came out sick, came out dope. We love it. Uh, and then it just kept going. Right. Uh, you know, we got black Adam, this Marvel thing, this other more TV shows, other opportunities going along. And, um, mm-hmm. You know, the first thing that always comes to my mind, because if you know the stunt world, you'll be shocked to know that not a lot of martial artists do it. Like you're talking about dancers, acrobatic, people that do acrobatics, gymnasts, um, you know, break dancers, like they're the ones that are leading the uh, stunt community. Mm. And you're like, what? You know, but you have these great coordinators that were like sport karate competitors as well. And, you know, great, some people that were sport karate, but what kind of like makes me kind of like upset is like, not a lot of them go back to the sport karate community, you know? And I noticed that about the sport karate community in general is that you don't have a lot of alumni go back and uh, do for the sport. And really there's not much for alumni, you know? you know, for them anyways, like, you know, commentating and stuff like that, like other sports have. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, you know, we're not, you know, like mainstream like that. But what I would, what I would love to see more is a lot of these alumni or sport karate past athletes to come back and, you know, do stuff for the sport karate world, you know, make it better, make it more mainstream. Right. Um, And that's always been my goal is to go back to the community, sport karate community, help it grow and, and, and again, like I said earlier, to show these different avenues that, mm-hmm. that these martial arts have spent their whole life doing, you know, like it, it bothers me to say, like, I heard, I heard a parent say to someone like, oh, you know, could have done baseball, could have done this, but unfortunately you did karate. And it's like, what do you mean? Unfortunately, <sighs> I'm like karate, yeah. karate, yeah, at least I wish the whole world did martial arts because it'll be a better world if the world did martial arts, right? <laughs> Completely. Preaching the martial the choir, arts man. teaches so much things and so much values in your life that we know that that it can take you anywhere that you want to mm-hmm. be or do anything that you want to do. Uh, but I thought I think that they don't see that as much because we don't bring that back or we don't give back as much. Um, and uh, you know. I, I'm sitting here thinking, no, you did a great job picking martial arts because there isn't, if you look at other sports, there isn't anything harder on your body. Like this, this is hard. You know, this is not easy. It takes so much discipline, so much, so much time, you know? And I was like, you know, whatever you decide to do, you're going to realize that because of this, I can do anything, you know, that this, this right here is easy because I did martial arts. And and um, For sure. now I'm seeing like, you know, really the connection of like what they can, they're using their martial arts for these different things. And I want them to know like, hey, if you want to do this, this is how you use your martial arts to do that. If you want to do this, this is how your martial arts can take you here, mm. you know? And uh, I think that's the biggest um, goal for my wife and I. We're very big on giving back to that community and making sure that our athletes, our kids, um, the people that we teach or that we help, um, can go somewhere with what they're doing, which is the martial arts, um, which had, which, uh, brought, brings us back to the bag, right? Yeah. Um, my dad would always say when I, when I always was training, he was, I was like, Oh man, I didn't win or, or something happened. I, I got to go back and train harder. He goes, no, no, no. You don't have to train harder. You have to train smarter. So my slogan all the time was always train smarter, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, people always say train harder, win easier, train harder, win easier. I've seen people train as hard as they can be big and, and, you know, buff up and, you know, cut and diet and do all this stuff and and just still perform terrible like it it has nothing to do with well first of all you need to train hard of course you need to be Mm -hmm. in a certain shape to do it but it we always say it's 90 percent mental and we always forget about the 90 percent mental we just work on that physical part but we never work on ourselves as humans you know we don't work on our brains we don't work on our, um, our reactions to certain things in our lives you know, and, and uh, that's why I always 
credit my life coaching and how it shaped me and made me a smarter person to do the things I want to do in life. And actually, I feel like the life coaching made me a better fighter as well. It's because I, I felt like my mind was elevated beyond any other fighter that stepped across me. I was like, listen, I know I'm smarter than you because I trained smarter because mm-hmm. I know how my body reacts to certain things or what my body needs and, or, or not to react to certain things in a certain way because I'm just smarter that way. And so I always tell people train smarter. One of the things is that bag, even though it was just a bag and it didn't hit me back. I had other people that would hit me and stuff like that. And, you know, I'll guard up and stuff like that. I always fought bigger people, you know, for training, mm-hmm. but for a sparring partner, I really just had that bag. But every time I looked at that bag, part of training smart was to see that bag and to see it as a fighter. Like even the way I react to it and I, I do my facial expressions as mm-hmm. I move was if someone was actually throwing something at me. So I would envision this person kicking me or punching at me and I would react and then create another reaction. And then that called it the chess game. Every time when you fight, you should always think like, like any grandmaster in chess, they think three moves or more ahead. You know, if, if they're, if they're good at chess, three moves are ahead. If they're great at chess, five moves are ahead. If they're grandmasters and they know what they're doing, they have the game in their head before they even start. What you do one move, they have the whole game in their head. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was me on the back. Have like that whole game in my head based on that side that they have out, based on the certain move that they tend to do. And I would always think, so much and people think that it's bad to overthink i think it's great that you think a lot you just have to commit and do after you think so much but it takes that that level of thinking that constant overthinking in a way to to be at that level you know and people don't talk about that they just talk about drills and fighting and stuff like that but they don't mention how you can train your mind to elevate yourself. So that created Marshall smart. And that's what Mm. my wife and I have right now. And that's our brand. That's our business. And Marshall smart. Our goal is to just show that everyone can, um, um, take what they do in the martial arts and do different avenues, but they learn the science of the martial arts and learn the science behind themselves. Mm. So it's everything from private coaching, uh, life coaching, uh, mentoring seminars, uh, professional speaking, even stunts, you know, all these different avenues in karate, but learning like the science behind these things and learning how to take martial arts into these different avenues, but to take themselves also and elevate themselves hmm. in a way. So that's why our slogan is train smarter behind martial smart. Uh, wow. And we, we love our logo because it's like uh, we have that uh, looks like a neuron and, and, and it's us kicking in the middle of it. You know, have the cool. atoms uh, right there. It, it, it looks, it's so cool. I, I love it. Um, but we're just so excited for that. Um, and, you know, right away, of course, we're doing, we booked about 40 seminars so far, uh, <laughs> just this, you know, just this year. And, um, you know, have, we're booked up with private clientele. And I started doing my business consulting to different schools. And that's growing from, from more schools are asking for me to consult them. And, and uh, alongside of us doing our stunts and stuff like that, but we're actually teaching our uh, young kids to do stunts. Um, and we're teaching yeah. our young martial arts to do stunts and create a, pro, uh, you know, uh, a reel and, you know, really giving them the steps like, hey, if you want to do stunts, you need A, B, and C. Because no one ever did that for us. You know, sure. it's like, and listen, and I'm not a person that goes, oh, no, if I teach you, you're going to take away my job. That's, that's not the case. Like, it, it's funny. It, it, you know, someone looks at me and goes, you know, Hey, you're the, you're the face and you know body type that we need for this. You know, and I'm going to say, Hey, listen, I need um, a six foot Asian guy. And, uh, and look at me and, and I say, do you know someone? Here's what I don't like. Most people go, Oh, I don't know. Uh, is there something I can do? And I'm like, well, why? If, if they're looking for that person in particular, like I would say, you know what, let me find something for you, you know, because and, that's uh, going to come back around. It's going to come back around. Exactly. And, um, 
but even then so create opportunities for others let the, let them you know let everyone enjoy the process and enjoy the opportunities you know uh, but not a lot of people have that mentality or mindset um but you know i do and that's why like i teach even other martial arts even high level martial arts that 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 are my age or younger and you know i'm like hey listen you're gonna kill it if you do this you know, and give them, you know, give them a plan or give them steps or help them to achieve that and give them, get them, get them their first job and, and stuff like that. And listen, by, by, by no means, um, do, am I saying I'm the world's greatest martial artist and no, no means am I saying I'm the world's greatest teacher I'm the world's greatest uh, stunt performer, actor, or what, or business consultant. I'm not saying that. I just want especially the young ones to, to know that martial arts can be so much more. And if I, if I can be the person to be the voice to say, Hey, look at what you can do. I'm going to do that. And that's, that's been my drive right now. And that's been my motivation. How can people find you? Social uh, media, websites, anything Facebook, like that. We, uh, we're working on our website, uh, I am Marshall smart.com, <laughs> uh, working on merchandise too, uh, <laughs> nice. um, Facebook, Justin Ortiz, uh, Instagram, the Ortiz experience. Uh, my, my, uh, my wife, Juliana Ramos Ortiz, her Instagram is karate.jules and you're going to see how much more famous she is on Instagram than I am, but that's <laughs> because I can't keep up with posting. I'm doing much better now, but it's, it's tough. Uh, but yeah. And uh, feel free to, you know, if anyone out there wants to ask us questions and uh, we're again, like I said, we're an open book, but we mean it, you know, we don't mind, you know, talking to people and stuff like that. Uh, if anyone interested in doing seminars, you know, business consulting, coaching, you name it, we're, we do that as well. Um, and uh, we've been doing this ranger seminar, which is really cool. Power ranger seminar. Oh, and, sweet. Uh, Tell us about that. Uh, so I think the biggest thing is, well, kids know power rangers mm -hmm. and they see them as heroes. But what we try to do is try to teach them that they can be a hero for the day. And, um, and it's really cool too, is what we've been doing is we've been putting that in conjunction with uh, schools that do mass intros. So, Super awesome. We did this at this guy named Josh Buford school in Mississippi. He, um, he, he, uh, had a mass intro of new people and he had his kids, his, his students do the seminar. So we're teaching them how to take their basic martial arts into a little fight scene, villains versus power rangers. But we teach them both sides, we teach them how to be a villain, teach them how to be a, uh, a ranger. And they learn how to do like basic fight choreo and reactions and stuff like that. But they have a blast. They're screaming. They're yelling. Awesome. They're they're acting with their faces and their body language, and they have a blast. And then at the end, uh, all these new people, and the the uh, head instructor would would uh, you know pitch them, like, hey, we have a deal for you today. And uh, the last one we did, he signed up like twenty new members that day. Um, and everyone knows. No matter what school you run, 20 new members is awesome for one day. That's a great deal. Uh, and we were so excited to do that for them because not only like business wise, but like the environment, the culture that we created and uh, helping them grow and, and his current students to see the avenues that they can go. It was like everything was in one bubble. And I was like, wow, this is everything that I pictured Marshall Smart to be. Um, so it was it was super cool. So we, we do those as well. And um, you know, try to help our martial arts community grow as well, business wise as well. So you you've I mean, people use the term dropping knowledge like way too much, in my opinion, but you've certainly done that today. You've you've taken us on really the the ride and, and we can unpack everything you've said from a number of layers, you know, the psychology of it, the physical aspects of it, the goal setting, it was just a ton there. But it, it is time to to wind it up. And so whether or not people go back and listen again, I hope they will. But how do you want to close up? How, you know, what kind of a bow do you want to put on this? I'll record an outro later, but, you know, your final words <laughs> to the people today. Uh, you've been you know, really generous uh, with your time. So what do you want to leave them with? 
you know, everyone, everyone says, uh, you know, ne- you know, never stop dreaming, never stop going for your goals, stuff like that. Um, I like to get further into that. Like I like to tell them when we were kids growing up, uh, we had this imagination in our head that was like unbelievable. Right. And I'll, I'll, I almost call it like Disney imagination. Right. Cause like, that's, that's the secret to Walt Disney's right. He never stopped having this imagination. And as a kid, we had this imagination that like we saw this world that no one else saw, which in their eyes are like, this kid's crazy. But in our eyes, <laughs> we had, we had, you know, we're fighting, you know, jet planes and crashing into things and, and uh, building structures and stuff like that. But it was, it was going in our head, but it made us smile. It made us happy. And if I can tell, if I can say anything to anyone is me and my best friend, Chris, we always tell them we're professional kids. <laughs> um, and that, that goes to simply saying that uh, we're just kids that grown up, but never stopped being kids. We never stopped um, having that imagination and we never stopped smiling. If at any point you stop smiling, if any point you don't feel happy, that is a sign. That is a problem. There's something we need to fix. That means we're not using our imagination to our fullest potential. We're not getting creative and we're not feeling fulfilled. So if I can tell anyone anything, it's just to don't stop smiling. Don't stop being happy. And don't stop being that little kid that you were before. You know, keep that imagination up because that that is that is what's going to take you further than what you thought you would ever be. And that's where I feel like it's taken me into so many different things now because I'm like, I'm imagining these things like a little kid. I'm like, I can do this, I can do that. Yeah, I can do that. And people are like, you're crazy. That's no, that's too much. And I'm like, well, just watch me. It makes me happy. I'm smiling now. I'm smiling every day because I feel fulfilled. So if that's what I can tell anyone. Don't stop smiling. Don't stop being a kid. I thought that was a great episode. I really enjoyed my conversation with Justin. Seemed like he had fun too. So that's always a good sign. You know, to hang out with another martial artist, talk martial arts and all the places that it can lead. And I think that was a highlight of this episode. It was talking about how martial arts led to so many different things for him in his life already. And I will be shocked if, you know, we, we look at him in 10 years and see that he hasn't done a bunch of other different stuff too. So super cool. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, I'm sure we'll talk again, Justin. Listeners. Go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out the links. Check out the show notes, photos, all the good stuff that we post over there. Check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. And don't forget, you can pick stuff up at the store, whistlekick.com with the code podcast15. You know, we make training programs. We've got those over there. And if you want to bring me to your school, do seminars. People that have me in say they have a really good time and they learn stuff. So that's kind of fun. If you want to follow us on social media, at Whistlekick, my emails, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>